Our speaker this hour is Sam Bartrug, born and raised in Westville County, West Virginia, graduated from Hundred High School, attended Ohio Valley College, also uh, later known as Ohio Valley University. He received his associates and bachelor's degrees in Bible. He married Martha Jean Yost in August of 71, and they were blessed with three children, Lee Ann Herr, Herr uh, Judith Jean Lawrence, and Richard Glenn Bartrug. His family has grown to include eight grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. Sam has uh, been a fixture in the, the Ohio Valley for many years, very well-loved and very well-spoken and a very good worker for the cause of Christ. He currently speaks for the Langs congregation each Sunday morning. He's partially retired but still doing gospel meetings and lectureships and things. I like this line in his bio that says he enjoys preaching and squirrel hunting in that order and uh, keeping their home in Beverly, Ohio as nice as possible. We're privileged to have Sam with us today and look forward to his lesson. Sam. I can't remember how many sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons he said I have, but that means I'm getting older. That's what it means. I am not a grizzled veteran of lectureships. Uh, I've spoken in a few in different places, but it's not been one of the things that I've done a lot of. For that reason, I'm hoping for one convert to my lesson on Be Calm today, and that's myself. Because <laughs> I've been a little nervous uh, all along through the process, and after listening to the five points the brother that spoke before us made right at the end of his lesson, I know why I've been nervous. So, uh, I guess we just have to remember it's not a competition. It's a companionship working together as partners serving the Lord. I want to tell you a story. It's a true story. It won't sound true, but it, it's a true story. I can't even use Neil Pryor's old line. He used to say, I found it in a church bulletin, so it has to be true. I can only tell you that it is a true story, and I tell it just about everywhere I go, every time I go there. My dad and I grew to be very, very close in my adulthood as I was becoming an adult. Uh, when we were growing up, he could have cared less about being our friend. And I've always been thankful for that because I didn't need a friend growing up. I had a lot of those, but I did need a parent and he fit that bill quite, uh, quite well. But he asked me, he said, Sam, would you take me over to Fairmont, to Fairmont Theater? He said, uh, Clint Eastwood's got a new movie out and I want to go see it. Because he wouldn't watch anyone but Clint Eastwood and John Wayne anyway. And uh, I said, well, sure I will, Dad. So we got to Fairmont and he said, well, Sam, would you mind before we go to, to the um, cinema, would you mind... Uh, taking me to Hill's department store. Now that dates the story because there hasn't been a Hill's department store in a long time. But I said, well sure dad, anything you want. And we walked in and you may remember the old Hill stores had a really long lobby and fairly wide and they had something crammed in every corner of their lobby and in one particular corner it had a bunch of gumball machines. And so I walked over and without even thinking, I put a quarter in and got my gumball and put it in my mouth. And Dad said, what you got? And I told him, he says, you know, I think I'd like to have one of those. So he went over, put his quarter in the machine, cranked it, got it out of the slot, put it in his mouth, went, no. <laughs> what in the world is that? And he threw it on the floor and it bounced all the way to the ceiling. <laughs> now I'm telling you that to tell you this. I hope by the time I finish, you don't feel like you put your money in the wrong machine. <laughs> uh, I hope to be able to say some things to you that will make an eternal difference. It reads in the New King James Version as follows. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. 
be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul crammed a lot of truth into those few verses. A lot of well-needed, much-needed truth. He realized that it has never been the safest or easiest thing to be a Christian. From the early days of Jesus and John the Baptist spreading the gospel wherever they went, letting people know the kingdom of heaven was at hand, to the day he died on the cross, to today when we as Christians meet together many times under ridicule or under difficulty, the message he preached boiled down pretty much to one thing. You matter because I care. You mean something to me because you're mine. And I don't want you to be nervous. I don't want you to be careless. I don't want you to be kind of upset and angry and doubting and discouraged and disillusioned. I want you to be calm. Well, how in the world do you be calm growing up the way the church did? What they faced makes what we sometimes go through trivial. But many of them stood fast, stood firm, and slowly but surely found the calm that God wanted them to have. And while it's never been the safest or easiest thing to be a true servant of God, it could be much worse than it is. There are people in our world who are hearing missionaries preach the gospel to them now who don't know whether they will live the, through the night because of anti-Christian feelings. We sit in our air-conditioned comfort. We dress to the nines. We come to church and everything's designed to make us comfortable, to make us uh, able to enjoy our faith for a little while together. But how do we function when things go bad? What do we do when what means more to us than anything else in the world becomes so difficult to live out in our lives? Because of persecution, because of belittlement, because of a variety of different negative influences, how do we learn to be calm in the midst of all of that? From the earliest records provided by the Old Testament, or as Jesus said it in Matthew 23 verses 35 and 36, God's people have been mistreated and persecuted from the time that Cain killed Abel to the time of Zechariah, whose blood was shed in the temple. The devil's deceitfulness created a scenario which ruined the peace and peace of mind that God meant for Adam and Eve to experience. Sadly, persecution and temptation has always been a part of being a Christian and it has robbed many believers of the calmness, the peacefulness that God made available to mankind. And just think with me for a moment of some well recognizable men and circumstances. Jesus himself was a target of assassination from the crib to Calvary. Luke alludes to the beheading of John the Baptist. All the Gospels have some form of Jesus relating 
to his disciples what was waiting for him when he got to Jerusalem that final trip. They even berated him, his apostles, his disciples berated him for saying such a thing as he might be crucified and die in Jerusalem. James, the son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' inner circle of disciples, died according to Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, of the most terrible crime you could ever imagine, being a steadfast Christian. You know, the world almost does look at that like a, like a crime. We know better. Stephen, in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, his innocence reeking from top to bottom, the blood flowing from the wounds the stones created, the mean glare of Saul of Tarsus holding the coats and cheering the mob on. Why? Because he tried to introduce God to people who had forgotten him. Paul is thought to have been beheaded, although we don't know for sure. We do get the sense in 2 Timothy, the last letter he wrote, that uh, he believed it was about over, that he was not going to get out alive this time. Peter was given a graphic look at what was going to face him in his older age because a horrific death, Jesus said in the last chapter of John, awaited him. In Revelation 2, verses 13 and 14, there's mention made of a man by the name of Antipas, or Antipas, who was a member of the church of Smyrna and who died in his service to God. What's all of that and others like them mean? It means Christians were mistreated. It means Christians were ostracized. It means Christians were imprisoned. Christians were murdered. How do you be calm with that kind of opposition? How do you shoulder all of those inevitable confrontations and not be nervous, not be upset? And yet Paul directs the church at Philippi to be calm. He doesn't use the word calm there, but he uses a synonym, be careful for nothing. Don't let this get the best of you. Don't allow this to ruin you and decimate your faith. Hang in there. Be calm. It may have seemed out of place given the hazards that were being uh, experienced by the Philippians. But his remarks to them are remarkably simple. Rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Don't be anxious. You've got God on your side. Don't worry about it. Just be faithful. Just be true. Even unto death, if need be, all will work out right. Embrace the peace of God. Don't try to understand it because it passes understanding. You and I lack the ability to describe the peacefulness that God can give to his people. Guard your hearts and minds. And know that as you stand as a sentry over your faith and trust, Jesus is right there guarding your hearts and minds with you. Paul wants the church at Philippi to know that there's nothing happening to them that's not happening to brethren in other places. That may not be much consolation, but what he says further about it is, you're not in it alone. When he explained to Joshua how Joshua was going to be victor, victorious over the, the different nations in the promised land, he encouraged him by saying, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
That left such an impression on the author of Hebrews that he included it in his letter that he wrote. He wanted Christians to know as he wanted Joshua to know centuries before that everything was going to be okay because they were never going to have to deal with it all alone. God would walk with us and talk with us and guide us and protect us. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Paul says, I would like for you to imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Those are beautiful words. But they're difficult words to live up to. You know, I have days when I look a lot like Jesus. Not in the sense that I have a physical resemblance. He, prob he may well have had a beard. He may well have been very short instead of tall. It, it, you know, it, it's not like I look like him physically. But there are days when I look a lot like him spiritually. I say the right prayer at the right time, and it helps someone. I make a visit to the hospital, and they're so glad to see me that they leave their imprint in my hand when they leave, or when I leave. There are times when I look just like Jesus. That's what Paul calls the church of Philippi to do. You be like me as I be like Jesus. Follow my example. Let Jesus know how much you care. So what are his four guidelines? Number one, rejoice. Verse 4 of Philippians chapter 4. When Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison. Things weren't going much better for him than they were going for uh, the Christians in and around Philippi. He, he was facing some of the same hardship and difficulty and persecution. But he found calmness and joy, Paul did, in a Roman prison. Why does that matter? Because leaders have to lead. Since we have been given the responsibility to lead people to Christ... How are we going to do it if we don't trust our own relationship with God? That we don't always waver right on the line of giving up or staying and holding on a little longer. Leaders must lead. We must give each other comfort. We must give each other hope. Just as Paul shared his calmness and hope with the church at Philippi. In verse 5, he calls for gentleness. We can bring some of our uneasiness and inner turmoil up on ourselves. In fact, I'm kind of convinced that a lot of times the worst battles we fight are inside ourselves. I don't worry too much about Satan. I don't take him uh, and underestimate him, but I don't worry too much about him. But I do worry a lot about me sometimes and how I handle situations and how I deal with them because the church needs to see in people like me and people like you who are the ones with, they look up to week after week after week. They need to know that the same qualities they're urging you to cultivate and develop are the ones they, through hard work and self-discipline, have already cultivated and helped. Paul says, live your faith. For the word gentleness means to be fair-minded or quick to, be, quick to forgive. While sometimes the enemies which are going to trouble us the most are those within us, there are things we can do to control our weaknesses, our personality flaws. We just can't let ourselves get too much involved in them. And we need to be willing to show others by what God has done for us 
bring us calm. We need to show that calmness to others. In verse 6, he says, be anxious for nothing. Be calm. It's just another way of saying that same thing. You know, I've found out through the years, and it's a simple truth. Why it took me so long to discover it, I'll never know. But you know, God will help those who need his help. And we don't need to worry about it. He won't give what's best to us as answer to prayer most of the time, or a little bit of the time. He'll give it every time. Now he won't do for us what we can do for ourselves. Prayer is not to get the assurance that God's going to study for what you have to take a test on next week. He's not going to study for you. You can do that yourself. But I think he will help you have a clearer mind, a clearer focus. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to worry. We're not in it alone. We must not stifle our trust in God to do what's best for us. The fourthly, he says... Find the peace of God that passes all understanding and know in your prayers and your thoughts and your Christian living that God is what we need most of the time. And I've learned, let him be God. He's better at it than you are. He's better at it than I am. We need God. And when we need God for something we can't handle on our own, like many times being calm, we need to turn to him to find it. He'll give it freely and fully. But keep in mind, God doesn't wear a wristwatch. He doesn't batter time or count time the way you and I do. When I ask him for something, it's urgent to me. When I ask him for something, it's something I feel I need both in the reality of the act, but also in the reality of time. I need it, and the faster the better. We forget one thing. We're not God. And we ought not to try to be. Let God be God. And what he'll do is when he knows it's best, he'll answer the prayer you prayed. Know that God won't let your prayers go unanswered. I don't know how many times I heard it growing up, but it was a lot of different times sitting in that church building at 100 West Virginia listening to C.W. Rock and others preach that gospel that I heard so much of. It was in all of that time frame that I learned that God won't let you down. Be calm. There's nothing that's going to happen to you that's bad that's fatal. God will take care of you. You know the word calm is interesting. We use it in our vocabulary a lot of ways. We tell someone sometimes, now calm down. Usually we have to say that when people have gotten kind of irritable or when people have gotten a little bit upset and they lose their cool, as we used to say back in the 60s. The Bible talks about Jesus and the calm before the storm. And it talks about Jesus in terms of having a calming effect upon us. Boy, he's calm, cool, and collected. I guess that's a compliment. But I think what it's saying is we understand calmness at some letter or level. 
it's good to strive for calmness. It lets you be more focused. It lets you exert your energies where they most need to be exerted. In Psalm 107, the story is told uh, of uh, Jonah with the or Je- I'm sorry, excuse me. That when Jesus spoke to the waters on the Sea of Galilee, according to Matthew 8, Mark 4, and Luke chapter 8, he brought calm to the raging storm. Probably helps us to know the background of the men who were in the boat with him. The men that were in the boat with him were seasoned fishermen. They made their living on the Sea of Galilee. It was kind of a fickle body of water. Usually it was very calm, the water's very smooth, you could fish all day and never be in peril. But every once in a while the winds would blow in and ricochet off the cliffs at one end of the Sea of Galilee and wash back into the sea causing the waters to churn until it scared professional fishermen. I've often tried to picture certain times in scripture that I would have liked to have been able to see or hear. I can almost see Jesus asleep down in the hold of the ship. Not a worry in the world. Calm enough to just drift off and go to sleep. The waters beginning to go from very smooth and navigatable unto Waters that are beginning to threaten the lives of those who are in that boat with Jesus. And then I see the disciples scurry down to find him and there he is asleep. And sleeping there they shake him to awaken him to the reality of what's happening. And in one version of the story one of them even says to Jesus don't you care that we perish? Folks, we ought to be ashamed when we're dealing with our relationship with God and Christ to even wonder if God cares. To even raise a doubt as to whether God cares. I almost can picture Jesus, although I doubt that he said this, I can almost picture him saying, what do you mean do I care? You've been with me for three years. You've watched me care for a leper. You've watched me care for cripples. You've watched me care for those with epilepsy. You've helped me care for those who this or that or the other. You've been with me when I've rescued you from certain situations. You've been with me to listen to what I'm entrusting to you to carry on when I'm gone. How can you even say, don't you care? I guess we can say it because we're kind of funnel vision. And we don't see Jesus as he speaks, be calm. We see the waters. We see the waves. We feel the rocking of the boat. May God help us to never doubt whether he cares for us or not. And remember, God does not wear a wristwatch. He is not bound by our time. He'll help us. He'll calm us down if we'll let him. But he can't do it without our agreement. We have to warn him to lest him. So what's God's role in all of this? I believe that what Paul's trying to say to Uh, Timothy is you trust God with all your heart and that'll stifle many of your fears trust him when I pillow my head of a night I don't even think of passing away in the night if I do I do if I don't I've just got another day to serve God he doesn't worry me I worry a little bit about dying, but I, I stopped being afraid of death a long time ago. I don't know wh- how I'll die. I don't know what I'll die from. I don't know the circumstances. That scares me a little bit. But I'm not afraid to die. 
because I know I'm God's. And I know what God's promised us. And that's enough to calm me down. That's enough to help me work with an even and cool and collected head. Trust God with all of your heart. And let trust guard your heart and mind. There are twin promises that Jesus talks about in verse 7, verse 5 and verse 7 of Philippians 4. One of them is that God's way of providing for us rock hard assurance that all will work out in time is through our trust in him. Never once doubting that he would do what he said to do. If I pillow my head tonight, I do so in security. I don't do it, it with ego. I do it with humility. I want what God can do for me. But what's our role in all of it? I think number one, strive for the trust and the joy that Paul found as he was singing in prison. Where we are should not forbid us to practice our faith. In fact, the most appropriate time to pray some of the hymns we sing so often is when we least feel like singing them. Because they remind us, they take us back to the simple hope and trust and that sense of clean that each of us experienced when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Strive for the trust that brings the joy Paul found as he sang in prison. Number two, times that call for calmness are also times when our godlikeness and the changes God has made in us should be on display. That's what Paul means when he talks about allowing God to be God, following his will for your life, and show people a difference God can make in people. There are people that live on your block that don't recognize calmness. They need to see it in you. We've got it if we'll just use it. It can change dynamically the, the people we know and encounter in life if we will just show them what God has done for us. And that the things that they get all in a snit about, the things that they get all upset and un, un, discouraged and about, all of those things can't begin to compare with being able to stand and look at life and those around you without worry. Number three, pray. Don't be careful in anything. That sounds like a good promise to you realize what it really means, doesn't it? It means don't worry about stuff. Be calm. Pray. Pray for yourselves. You may need it more than you realize. Pray for your oppressors. I love my brethren. I find a few of them harder to like than I probably should, but I love my brethren. There's not, there's not a brother or sister in Christ anywhere in our brotherhood that I wouldn't help, no matter what they've said about me, no matter what they've done. If I encountered them along the road with a flat tire, I'd stop and put it on. I love my brethren. I love them with all my heart. And I need to bring God into vogue when I'm talking with them or sitting down to talk with God and make sure I pray about them. Add, as Paul did in verse 7, some, some uh, 
excuse me for a minute, my mouth's getting dry. Uh, some uh, calmness in the sense that we know that whatever happens will be okay. Pray for those who are in the same boat you are. We don't always know what others are going through. I sometimes say, after I listen to the announcements being made, uh, that there's just never any shortage of misery. There, there's plenty of it out there. By the way, this has probably been announced, but if it hasn't, I want you to, to know about it. Tom Butterfield is in the hospital, or has been in the hospital at Camden Clark. Uh, he passed out a week or so ago at a dentist's office, and he's not doing real well. He may have been released, but I didn't know if you had an update on that or not. Just wanted to let you know that, and had a call from my good friend Tom Miller, uh, while Randy Chapman and I were on the way over here. And uh, Tom has a surgery coming up next Tuesday. It's, it's hopefully the last in a long line of surgeries he's gone through. But he asked me to ask you to remember him in his prayers. It's not the surgery that's getting to him. It's the surgeries having them and seems uh, he's at that point where he wonders if it's ever going to end. Just keep in mind because we don't always know what other people are going through. Went to a restaurant in New Martinsville. I know none of you have ever eaten there, the court. Yeah. Uh, I think they ought to just close off one server or one section of that uh, lobby for preachers after church on Sundays. But thank you very much. He let his kindness and care be shown. And I'm suffering the same malady the other speaker did. I'm starting to run out of time. Run out of time. But a waitress came to wait on us. And she was late getting there, and a couple of the fellows I was with, there were four or five preachers. Boy, there ought never to be that many preachers in one place at the same time. But uh, they were getting ready to uh, kind of be critical of her and say a couple things to her. And I said, don't do that. I said, we don't know what she's going through. Now, here's the kicker. I was in a meeting at Proctor that week. And when I went to church that night and got up in the pulpit, I looked back and that waitress was sitting in the pews. Could you imagine the feelings that I would have left her or we would have left her if we'd have gone through and criticized her? I had a chance to talk to her a little later that evening after services and she told me some of the issues she was battling with. And later I restored her to the church and we had the opportunity to watch her grow and develop more as a Christian. But we, we need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for our oppressors. We need to pray for others that are dealing with the same things we have. We need to pray and cling to the promises of God. We need to pray and hold tight to the peace of God. Even though we can't and don't fully understand it. We need to pray and pray that times like this will motivate us to be a little bit more like Paul when he sang in prison. Galilee was a busy place. The Sea of Galilee was a busy body of water. But she was fickle. She could feed a village and turn right around and drown a boat full of men. As Jesus slept peacefully in the, the hold of the boat, the waters raged and the winds blew. His disciples awakened him and pled with him to save them, even questioning whether he cared for them or not. So he arose, he rebuked them for their lack of faith. He cried out a rebuke to the winds and the water. And there was a great calm. Folks, the God who could calm the stormy waters of the Sea of Galilee 
can calm whatever your heart's struggling with today by way of issues and challenges. Be calm. If it's beyond your ability, let God take care of it. He will. If it's not beyond your uh, ability, work on it. Challenge yourself to just dig in and do it. I'm not much of a procrastinator when it comes to a variety of different things, but there is one thing I procrastinate a lot about. Andy can tell you that my paper is usually the last one that comes in. <laughs> but it's in part because I study, that, I study it deeply, and I hope that study has shown itself a little bit to you. And if we haven't accomplished anything else this hour, let's be able to face the rest of this day with a calm that only God can give us. Thank you.